Assalamu alaikum everyone. We will continue our lecture on topic 4, Basic Macroeconomic Relationships. In this video, we will look at the relationship between income and consumption, as well as the relationship between income and saving. One of the best established relationships in macroeconomics is the relationship between income and consumption. And in examining that relationship, we will also be exploring the relationship between income and saving. This is because saving is income that is not spent. Many factors contribute to the nation's level of consumption and saving, but the most important factor is disposable income. Recall from an earlier topic, disposable income is income after paying taxes. In other words, it is income that you are free to use, or dispose of, once you have fulfilled all of your tax obligations. The relationship between consumption and disposable income is represented by the consumption schedule, or consumption function. The consumption function shows a positive or direct relationship between consumption and disposable income, which is evident in many household budget studies. The relationship between saving and disposable income is represented by the saving schedule or saving function. Therefore, the relationship between disposable income, consumption and saving is DI equals to C plus S. Here is a visual representation of the relationship between income and consumption as well as the relationship between income and saving. As you can see, both consumption and saving have a positive or direct relationship with income. Therefore, the consumption line and saving line are both upward sloping. However, consumption is a bigger portion of the disposable income compared to saving because people tend to save more only when their income level is bigger. So, the saving schedule is much flatter than the consumption schedule. Disposable income, consumption and saving are all interconnected. The 45 degree line is a reference line that represents all points where consumption equals to disposable income, meaning that at point E, the amount of consumption would be exactly equal to the amount of income. Point E is known as the break-even income, which is the level of disposable income at which households plan to consume all of their income and save none of it. So if all income were spent, then there would be no saving. That is why saving is zero in the diagram underneath. At very low or low levels of disposable income, or to the left of E, households tend to spend more than they earn during the year. Thus, this saving occurs. These savings are usually financed by borrowing or using up their wealth. Beyond the break-even income, or to the right of E, households earn more than they wish to spend so they are able to save more now. Let's take a look at a numerical example to understand these relationships better. In this example, we have a hypothetical schedule that shows various amounts of what households plan to consume at each level of disposable income. Columns 1 and 2 show the hypothetical consumption schedule. Because saving is income that is not spent, to find the amount saved, all we need to do is subtract consumption from disposable income. Look at column 3. Here is what the table shows visually. Remember that at each point on the 45 degree line, consumption equals disposable income. So we can see the saving happening at low levels of income. As households earn more, they will be able to make their spending while have some of their income left for saving. Here are some observations on the relationship between income, consumption, and saving. The 45 degree line is a reference line representing all points where consumption is equal to the disposable income. The consumption function has a positive slope because consumption increases as disposable income increases. The saving function is also positively related to disposable income, but saving is a smaller proportion of a small disposable income. Consumption is a bigger portion of disposable income and that people tend to save more the bigger the income. Beyond the break-even income, household earns more than they wish to spend. The part of disposable income that is not spent is called saving. 
At low levels of disposable income, households tend to spend more on goods and services than they earn during the year. Thus, this saving occurs. As level of income is the basic determinant of both consumption and saving, a change in income will cause a movement along the consumption and saving functions. Now, let's move on to additional characteristics of the consumption and saving schedules. John Maynard Keynes argued that as income grows, so does consumption, but by less than income. This is why, if you look at the diagrams in the previous slides, the consumption line is flatter than the 45 degree line. Marginal propensity to consume, or the MPC, is the proportion of any change in income that is consumed. From the formula, you can see that it is a change or extra consumption resulting from a given change in real disposable income. Visually, the MPC is the slope of the consumption schedule. What would households do with an extra ringgit of real disposable income if they do not spend it? Well, they will save it. So marginal propensity to save, or the NPS, is the proportion of any change in income that is saved. From the formula, you can see that it is a change or extra saving resulting from a given change in real disposable income. Visually, the NPS is the slope of the saving schedule. Besides the marginal propensities to consume or to save, another important concept related to the consumption and saving schedules is the average propensities. The average propensity to consume, or the APC, basically tells us how much of the income was spent, while the average propensity to save, or the APS, tells us how much of the income was saved at each level of disposable income. To find the APC or the APS, we simply divide total consumption or total saving with total disposable income. Since disposable income is either consumed or saved, the fraction of any disposable income consumed plus the fraction saved must exhaust that income. Therefore, mathematically, APS plus APC must be equals to 1. Similarly, the sum of the MPC and the MPS for any change in disposable income must also equals to 1. This is because spending and saving out of an extra income is an either-or situation. As we have learned earlier, the fraction of any change in income that is not consumed, by definition, will be saved. Now let's take a look at this example again, but this time we extend the information to include calculations of the average and marginal propensities to consume and the average and marginal propensities to save. You may pause this video to try and work them all out. From our example here, you can see that the APC falls as disposable income increases, while the APS rises as disposable income goes up. The amounts of MPC and MPS are consistent for each level of income. And if you add both APC and APS, it will equals to 1 at each level of income, as well as the total of MPC and MPS will also be equal to 1 at each level of income. As mentioned at the beginning of this video, there are many factors or determinants that affect the amounts household will consume or save. A change in any of these determinants will cause a shift of the consumption and or saving schedules either upwards or downwards. These other determinants are non-income and they are wealth, expectations, interest rates, borrowings, taxation, and stability. Let's take a look at wealth first. Wealth is the amount of all assets that households own minus their total debts. Wealth are built by saving money out of current incomes. So if there is an increase in wealth, the incentive to save will fall. The consumption schedule shifts up and saving schedule shifts down. The opposite occurs when there is a fall in wealth. Then we have expectations. Changes in expected future prices or wealth can affect consumption spending today. If we expect price to increase, consumption schedule will increase and saving schedule will fall today. The next determinant is real interest rates. Declining interest rates increase the incentive to borrow and consume and reduce the incentive to save. 
because a lot of household expenditures are not interest sensitive, the effect of interest rate changes on spending are modest. Household debt is another determinant of consumption and saving. Higher levels of borrowing or increase in borrowing will shift the consumption schedule up and saving schedule down. Next is taxation. Higher taxes will reduce disposable income, so both consumption and saving schedules shift downwards, vice versa for lower, ta lower taxes. And last but not least is stability. Economists believe that consumption and saving schedules are generally stable unless deliberately shifted by government actions.